I'll say something a little bit about what we've done this year in Community of Learners. My hope with Community of Learners has been that we are able to see that our faculty are, are uh, people who have interests that go beyond the courses we teach as well. We are generalists in many ways at this university, and so we, uh, we are trained in a specialty, but we come and we teach broadly at Spring Art University. And uh, most of us love that. There, there are uh, great benefits of that. Uh, we were all trained, though most of us were trained at research institutions, where we're trained to be specialists as well. So the Community of Learners events are an opportunity for us to see our faculty interests. What are our faculty's specialties? What, what are their sort of pet projects in all the spare time that we have? Uh, what, what do we do in that free time? What are we interested in? So uh, Dr. Ruben Rubio will be speaking uh, to us today about uh, just such a, a very, very important interest in his life. So uh, without further ado. So we're going to start off with a video. So if you didn't get the lyrics, they're outside by the front door. And hopefully you will be able to follow on there. The song is in Spanish, but it's got lyrics in Spanish and English. Es muy triste. O sea, hay palabras, ¿verdad? Para decirlas. Y hay problemas, pero pues todo lo que uno no ha vivido no lo puede platicar en unos 5 o 10 minutos. Eres un criminal porque cruzaste la línea sin ningún documento. Nunca hay que quedarnos por vencido. Hay que volver a intentar. Empacó un par de camisas, un sombrero, su vocación de aventurero, seis consejos, siete fotos, mil recuerdos. Empacó sus ganas de quedarse condición de transformarse en el hombre que el Señor y no ha logrado y fue Dios con una mueca disfrazada de sonrisa y le suplicó a su Dios crucificado en la repisa el resguardo de los mundos y perforó la frontera como pudo El mojado tiene ganas de secarse, el mojado está mojado por las lágrimas que bota la nostalgia. El mojado, el indocumentado, carga en hombros ese bulto que legal no cargaría ni obligado. El suplicio de un papel lo ha convertido en positivo Y no es de aquí porque su nombre no aparece en los archivos Ni es de allá porque se fue Si la luna suave se desliza por cualquier cornisa Sin permiso alguno Porque el mojado precisa Comprobar con visas que no es de Neptuno Mojado Sabe a mentira tu verdad Sabe a tristeza la ansiedad De ver un frío y soñar con la vereda Que conduce hasta tu casa Mojado Mojado de tanto llorar Sabiendo que en algún lugar Espera un beso haciendo pausa desde el día en que te marchaste. Si la visa universal se extiende 
el día en que nacemos y caduca en la muerte porque persigue mojado si el consul de los cielos ya te I'd like to welcome you all this morning, and today we're going to be talking about immigration across our southern border. And so I was hoping that we could have the first community of learners with a Spanish title, and that is, if you have questions about undocumented immigrants, ask a Chicano, and that person would be myself. Um, I came from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was born there 52 years and some change ago. And, um, I, uh, I came to Michigan in order to go to school at the University of Michigan, and then I just kind of stuck around. It's funny, when you, when you land somewhere for a few years, your kids get used to living somewhere, and you, and you realize that wherever you planted yourself new is called home. So that's, uh, that's why we're still here. And I, it is my pleasure to be here at Spring Harbor University. I've been here, this is my, closing out my 13th year here. Um, and a couple of things I just wanted to mention about the video we just saw. First of all, the word mojado, you've probably maybe seen if you've ever been in a, at a store or someplace where they're doing some cleanup work and the floor is a little wet, it might say wet area or wet floor or wet wet uh, uh, something on one side, and you might see something that says piso mojado on the other side. And so mojado is kind of a, a general word for like a, a wet surface, but the, the real uh, nickname is wet back, and that's the name we call people that would come across the Rio Grande River or actually they call it in Mexico, the Rio Bravo, and come into the United States. Now, there's not a river that runs across the entire southern border. It's just that part between Texas and Mexico. But, uh, but that's sort of where the name comes from. Um, that last slide uh, said that there were about, well, over 300,000 people deported um, in 2012. The current administration has deported more people back across the southern border from Mexico and points further south than any other administration has done. And then it also said that over 700 people have died trying to cross the border in some way. In other words, trying to, trying to get someplace. The woman at the very end um, said that she was just looking for a better place to live for her family and herself. And that's basically what these people are looking for. And they come from Mexico. They also come from points further south in Central America and even further in South America. So that's going to be the, the, uh, the topic of our talk today. So a little prayer I usually give. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So if you've ever been to the Statue of Liberty, you've probably seen this famous quote at the very at the, at the base of it. And there's this, this probably familiar uh, 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 cut from that quote. Give me your tired, your poor, 
Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And right above those words is Lady Liberty in New York Harbor, a symbol of immigrants for many, many years. Um, in the southern border, I think we have uh, fences and cactuses to greet people when they come from there. Um, it's a big difference in how we've treated, how we've looked on immigrants, although there are some similarities, and we'll talk about that also. So I, I thought sometimes when I say, you have some questions, sometimes I'll say, okay, so what are the questions? And then we just kind of stare at each other for a few minutes. So I'm going to plant four questions for you, okay? The first one is, why is this lecture different from all other lectures? Yeah, we'll cover that. Uh, the second one is, why do so many Latinos or Hispanics want to come here? Fair question. Uh, the next one, why can't they cross legally and assimilate and just speak English? Okay, why all the fuss? And then finally, and if, if, I, if I didn't ask this question, I think it would be a kind of a waste of time to be here, is there a lesson I can learn from all of this? Okay. So those are the four questions I'll plant, we'll cover, and then if hopefully you'll have some questions of your own, you're welcome to ask. So let's start with that first one, okay? Why should this topic matter to you? Well, there's the usual stuff, right? Liberal arts, okay? This is Spring Arbor Liberal Arts University. Um, one of the things we want to be able to do is increase our political and cultural literacy, right? So that's clearly there's an advantage in knowing something about immigration. Even though we're here in Michigan and Canada is across a couple of lakes and Mexico is a long ways away. But even here in Michigan, we have issues in terms of immigration. Um, I was just reading an article recently that said that we've got about 150,000 undocumented immigrant families here in Michigan. And if you are going to be working um, in places like Lenawee County, Ottawa County, Ingham or Eaton County, uh, Southern Monroe County, Bay County, Genesee County, or Berrien County, then you're probably going to run across, uh, or Muskegon County, or Kent County, throw a couple more in, you're probably going to run across some of these families, whether you're teaching or involved in some other social aspect of, of the profession, or if you're just in the service sector, or some other professional field, uh, you're gonna run across these families. It's gonna be more and more, as more people come into the country, and as the population here, which has a higher birth rate than the native population of, of Euro-Americans, as their birth rate increases, then uh, you're gonna see more and more uh, Hispanic families and children, and so it's gonna be more of, of something we have to understand. It's also a matter of voting, right, because we have to be able to understand what the policies are and vote for the right people and, and people that uh, support our beliefs, which I hope have some kind of a biblical perspective. And I think that's very important that we be able to bring a biblical perspective to the table when talking about immigration. It's easy to get stuck in economics. It's easy to get stuck in, stuck in civics. And it's harder sometimes to cross those lines and think where does a biblical perspective come into play here. So I think that's really important for us. Another one, like I said, the future of the U.S. and even Michigan is going to be less and less white. Already in my home state of New Mexico, it's been a, quite a few years when the, the minority population is the majority population. Uh, I don't know if you've paid attention to the news, but California just reached that point fairly recently. And other states are going to be following suit. So, like I said, even though we're further away from the, from the border, we, never, we may never see a Michigan that's more Hispanic and, and African American and Asian American than not. Nevertheless, the future of the United States is getting uh, less and less white. I had a, a, a recent graduate of our teacher education program was, went to work in Arizona. And some of the places where there's a lot of jobs in teaching are places where you see a lot of, of immigrant families, and many of them are undocumented. And, and so she said her awareness, sensitivity, and understanding of the issue went exponentially through the roof once she ended up in Arizona. So it's, uh, it's not unlike, unlikely that many of you might find yourselves in some of those southern states or even places like like Chicago, Illinois, or New York, or places where there's a large Hispanic population further away from the southern border. One of the things that we, we probably should understand is that we have immigration laws, we've had them for over 100 years, but those laws are mainly meant to protect who we are, whatever that means. For example, in 1924, that was the first serious immigration law that was passed and that was a, a complete response to the worry that we had too many people that were not Euro-American that were gonna somehow distort the, the ethnic heritage of America. And so 
the quote, there was a quota system put in place that said we're only going to limit immigration to 2% of the people from your country that are, are currently in the United States. Um, so it was meant to ver be very restrictive. And it, in large part, it was a throwback to the immigration from Southern and, and Eastern Europeans and Jews. So if you have an Italian or Romanian or Greek or Bulgarian or you, uh, Slavic, Serbian, any of those peoples, um, then that was you. Those were your ancestors that people objected to, and they passed that Immigration Act. In 1952, uh, that was the first time that there was an, an amendment to our Naturalization Act to allow non-whites to become citizens. So up until 1952, which is a fair amount of our history, a non-white could not actually become a naturalized citizen of the United States. In 1965, with all of that was going on in the Civil Rights Movement, uh, there was a, a kind of a thought of how did this apply to immigration? And so what happened is there was a fairly significant change in, um, in, the, in the quota system. So the quota sort of went out, although a cap came in. I'm still trying to figure out the difference between quota and a cap. But basically, a cap allowed more people to come in. And instead of just looking at a country of origin, it looked at other factors. It looked at, do you have family that are already in the United States that are trying to reunite families? They looked at employment issues. They were looking to sort of look for skilled workers, white collar workers, um, people with professional degrees, um, to, 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 because they were starting to see that uh, there was a chance that down the road we would need some help in the United States getting more skilled labor, skilled workers. I don't want to say skilled laborers. I'm talking about white collar people too. So they were looking at, at, at that and they, they sort of asked the question, if there were Americans that aren't there that can fill the void, then you're welcome to bring in somebody from outside. To, to do that. Um, then there was also uh, sort of a, 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 an allowment to, for people who are diverse. In other words, there was a lottery started up for about 10% of the people they would let in the country who were just diverse, just to kind of uh, you know change the color, the landscape, so to speak, of the country. Um, in 1986, uh, there was the first look at the problem of illegal immigration or undocumented immigration as, as the administration at the time looked at it. And uh, they did a couple of things. They tightened up border security. And living in New Mexico, I saw some of these measures uh, come into play uh, where they were a little, a little uh, tougher on what your business was coming to the U.S. and looking into your vehicles and, and searching things. You know, it's a little more rigorous than it was before. Um, but they also gave amnesty to several million, uh, a couple million uh, undocumented immigrants that were already in the United States. Um, in 1990, there was a big increase in the cap. It sounded really great, like a five-fold increase, like, wow, somebody saw the light back in 1990. But actually, what the, the upshot, because they still had, I still don't know what a different cap in a quota is, but they had this thing where only 7% of anybody that came in could be from any one country. So, the, so even with the big increase in 1990, only up to about 25,000 people could come from any one country, and that's, that's on, a, on a, some kind of a visa. Um, so that's pretty much where we've been. Now, we've had a lot of efforts, probably in, in your lifetime, but especially lately, since you were probably in high school and, uh, and, and in college, to try to reform our immigration policies, but they haven't all worked. And one of the two things, they've, one thing they've been stuck on is what's called the pathway to citizenship. In other words, we have people that are in the country. We know they're here uh, without documentation. What do we do with them? The, the initial thought was, let's throw them all out. But we're talking about 11 or 12 million people here. Um, so, the, so that was a little unrealistic and actually kind of xenophobic. So the next uh, solution to think about was, okay, if they're gonna be here, how can we kind of work them into our culture, and especially economically, because the big worry is, are they gonna take jobs away from Americans, and do we have to spend money on them through our social programs? So um, that path to citizenship is sort of the big discussion that's still out there even today. Now, interestingly, uh, the current administration uh, was one of the ones, actually, the last three administrations have all said they wanted to do something about uh, immigration. The Bush administration, President Bush kind of fought his own party because as, as former governor of Texas, he had maybe a more realistic look at immigration and what a good immigration policy was than some of the people in his own party. But, they, but even with, with uh, President Bush having uh, uh, his own party in charge of Congress for a few years during his administration, could never get a comprehensive immigration uh, bill passed. President Obama uh, was thinking about doing that, and, and he had a couple years in his administration when he had control of Congress, but no, nothing ever showed up. 
it was after he lost control or his party lost control of the House that he started to hear him talk about immigration policies. And I personally saw that as a little more of a political tool than caring for people specifically. Sorry about that. Um, this summer, I went and looked at some uh, at the border. So I don't know if you guys have ever been to the border before. It's one of my recommendations at the end to try. But uh, here's some pictures of it. First of all, uh, this is uh, the, the Rio Grande near, near Las Cruces, New Mexico. And uh, one of the things you don't realize is the river dries up from time to time. So yeah, this time of year, it's probably got water in it. But this time of year, which was like in late September, early October, uh, there was no water in the river. That happens from time to time. So if you think that a river is going to give you a, a kind of a nice boundary, now further, this is because of their, they dammed the river because they've got a lot of population in New Mexico and in Colorado, so they dammed the river a lot to try to uh, get some, have some water reserve. When you get deeper into Texas, though, the river reappears a bit, but it's, it's kind of measly, honestly. So it's, it's not really much of, a, much of a detriment to crossing, except in some areas in Texas, it gets pretty deep and pretty nasty currents and people do drown there pretty easily. Um, this is right on the border. This is uh, called La X. If those of you who know a little Spanish, probably recognize that as the X. And this was just, just dedicated uh, almost a year ago. And it sits right on the border. So I'm standing in a like a little ball field in El Paso, Texas. And uh, that X is in Mexico. And there's a, there's a highway there. You can see kind of in, the, in between us right here. And uh, this X is pretty humongous, actually. It's about... Um, I think about the equivalent of a 15-story building. And the plan is that they have a viewing area right here so you can look out across El Paso and Juarez. But this is kind of a symbol of, of Mexico um, and also harkens back to, to the Aztec heritage of within Mexico as well. So it's not just celebrating the Spanish background, but also the Native American background. Uh, this is a, one of several flags that the Mexican government uh, planted, if you will, along the border to celebrate who Mexico is. It's sort of a, like say, hey, here's Mexico over here, guys. It's called La Bandera Monumental, which if you know Spanish means a big flag. Um, but it is a big flag. It's about uh, 50, I think this, this thing's about 50 meters tall, the flag post. And the flag itself is about 25 meters wide and about 50 meters high. So it's, it's a big flag. And you can see it's pretty well for miles around. So between the X and the flag, you have no doubt where the Mexican border is when you're in El Paso, Texas. There are several points of entry. This is actually the smaller one from El Paso, but I took some pictures underneath this bridge. But this is a bridge. This is Mexico in the foreground here. This is El Paso, Texas in the background. These are the Franklin Mountains, and this is the old El Paso del Norte, the way into uh, Mexico's northern territory. And that's where the town of El Paso, the city of El Paso got its name from. And Juarez, which is the, across the, the, the river here in Mexico, is actually bigger than El Paso, uh, but it was also called, this whole area was called El Paso del Norte once upon a time. So uh, you can see there's a lot of folks that want to cross into the United States, and they have to all go into little lanes on the, once they're on the other side. Um, this is underneath that, so some nice little palm trees there. This is Avenida Cesar Chavez right here, which runs right along the border on the United States side. On the Mexican side, they have a, a, a comparable road named after uh, the, the young men who were reputed to be heroes uh, from who jumped out of Chapultepec Palace to uh, rather than surrender to the Americans during the Mexican-American War. If you don't know about that, you should really know about it. Um, this is underneath the bridge. Okay, and you can see the barbed wire is really inviting here. Make sure you don't uh, jump, jump in. Uh, these are cars coming up from Mexico. Once they cross and they go underneath the bridge and out and into El Paso. Um, this is part of the infamous border fence you might have heard of before. It's about as tall as a semi truck. And usually the fence is built up uh, on, a, on a high area. So the fence itself is about as high as a semi truck. And then there's a, a lot of ways to get to the fence in the first place. So it's a very high fence. And it's not easy to cross, but it's not uncrossable at all. Um, this is a shot of La Migra. Now, as it turns out, the Border Patrol, and that La Migra is the, the kind of the nickname in Spanish for the Border Patrol. Uh, it turns out that they, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't like being watched. Uh, we played a little cat and mouse here. I'm just sitting here taking some pictures, and I noticed that they noticed me, and they started moving around, and uh, I started moving around, and then they came up behind me kind of sneakily, and uh, yeah, just kind of, yeah, they don't want to be uh, tracked at all. Um, so I didn't want to mess with too much. Um, but there's the Border Patrol again. This is Mexico back over here. That little uh, building is in Mexico. So believe it or not, the Rio Grande River is between that truck and that building right there. Um, 
So here, basically I walked into somebody's backyard. Literally, it's this, it's this uh, it looked like a boarding house, and it was pretty rough, pretty rough looking. And I walked in the back and thought, well, I'm not armed, so I'm probably going to be okay. I, I can talk my way out of anything. Um, there's a, this is an irrigation ditch right there. There's the, the border patrol right there. This is the Rio Grande River right here in this little bit, and there's Mexico right over there. So it's, uh, you know, there it is. So you can see why, uh, in some places, it's very easy to cross. It's not, there's not much challenge at all. Obviously, the big challenge is getting past the border patrol. Uh, they patrol this area constantly. They have surveillance. They have lights at night. So uh, they, they pretty much know when something's going on. Um, the fence sort of begins and ends in different places. So here's kind of, I don't know, either begins or ends right here. Over to the left, it's just basically a chain link fence with barbed wire on top. Then you get this. So as more money becomes available, they're going to try and build this fence. This fence looks differently depending on where you're at. You have seen other pictures that have big slats where you can maybe get half your head in between. They have some areas where they've got kind of make it difficult. They, they put like a, a ramp on both sides and make it difficult. The fence is inside of U.S. territory, so it doesn't actually straddle the border. So there is a little bit of U.S. territory just on the other side of the fence. Um, this is a fairly famous uh, thing called the drag. Um, when you've got the fence going into the desert like this, what they do is they clear out this area right here. And that way, if somebody crosses over, they can see the footprints, and then they can follow where they're at. And the Border Patrol uses, uh, they use drones, they have surveillance cameras, they have all-terrain vehicles, they have four-wheel drives, they have motorcycles. Just about any vehicle you can imagine the Border Patrol has. And so they can kind of figure out if somebody's crossed and where they've gone. And then every once in a while, they'll, they'll go and they'll kind of clean up the drag. What they'll do is they'll just drag um, some two, some railroad ties tied together behind it and just kind of smooth it out again so that they can see uh, somebody else. Uh, this is uh, called Mount Cristo Rey. This is actually a, a, a kind of a, a, a place of prayer, uh, especially for people in the Catholic faith. If, if you know the, the, the geography of New Mexico, Texas, and Mexico, it's kind of at the point where all three of them meet. Um, this is right about where this is. So uh, this is kind of a tricky subject right here because this runs, this straddles the border, and yet you want pilgrims from both Mexico and the U.S. to be able to get to the top. So uh, this is this, this, uh, kind of a, its own thing. Uh, so the border fence goes wi widely around Mont Cristo Rey, and you have to get permission to go up there, uh, from at least from our end. This is a shot of El Paso del Norte, so that's the pathway into the, basically up the Rio Grande River to the United States. This is more or less looking uh, northeast, and those are the Franklin Mountains in the background, and the, the town of Sunland Park, New Mexico, in the foreground. And then this is another shot into Mexico again. So that plateau there is in Mexico, and uh, uh, somewhere between where I'm standing and over here is the border. Another thing that runs along the border from, for a, a fairly fair part of it, at least in this neck of woods, is the railroad tracks. Um, so it's kind of interesting. There's a, a fair amount of, of, of uh, railroad traffic between the U.S. and Mexico. So hopefully in giving you some of these pictures, I've sort of given you an idea of what the border looks like. That was, that was sort of my goal. So here's another of the four questions, right? Why do so many people want to come? Well, here's the one thing you want to remember. This is kind of a, a you've probably heard the saying before, right? We didn't cross the border, but the border crossed us. Again, if you know history, uh, in the Mexican-American War, what happened is, um, the United States acquired a fair amount of Mexican territory. And uh, as a result, you know, sometimes when you, when you read that in the history book and you read, oh, the U.S. acquired a lot of territory, you think, wow, isn't that cool? But what you don't also realize is they acquired a lot of people at the same time. And the people that were acquired were people that were used to living as Mexicans, not as Americans. They were people that desired to live as Mexicans and really had no desire to live as Americans. Suddenly, they were U.S. citizens. And so that was where the U.S. instantly acquired a Mexican population was for the Mexican-American War. So um, that sort of always has resonated in the background. In other words, the fact that we've been separated. There are, there are kin that are up in our, in our northern part of our country that were lost from us. Um, and, and, you know, when you, when you lose a great part of your land and some of your people like that, that tends to stick with you for 150 years or more. So that's something that's kind of always in the in the in, in the background. It's something that if you don't, if you if you see, oh, we acquired land and don't realize we acquired people too, and then what do we do with them? Well, one of the things we did is we took their land away. <laughs> they had the people that were there had land grants.
from the, from the Spanish government that were honored by the Mexican government when Mexico became independent from Spain. But then, when the United States came in, they sort of said, oh, that stuff's all out the door. We're going to start over again. And so families that had been on land for, for many generations lost that land. So there's some, some dismay from that. Um, but these things kind of make sense, right? There's people want to come across the border into the United States if they have a desire for stability and safety, if they want to share in the wealth of the U.S., and if they have a kinship by population, by, by geography, or by religion. So let me tell you a little story um, about uh, the Soto family. And the Soto family is my great-grandfather and great-grandmother, and they lived down in Mexico. They, they originally from Zacatecas, and then they moved to Torreon. Now, Torreon in Mexico is not far from South Texas. Um, one of the things that, that, that happened in this time period, which is about the, the 1910, 1915, 1916 era, there was a, a guy named Pancho Villa that was in operation in Mexico. And he was opposing the Mexican government. He was trying to overthrow it. And one of the things he did was he was trying to find people that would join his band, sometimes willingly and sometimes unwillingly. And so he would conscript people that he thought he could to, to into, his, into, his, uh, into his army. And then once he got a big enough army, he would skirmish with the, with the Federales, with the Mexican government. So um, in the area of Torreon was, was a major battle, probably the biggest battle that Pancho Villa fought against the Mexican government. Now, my great-grandfather, I never actually asked him this question. He overlapped my life by about five years, but at the age of five, I didn't really know much about Pancho Villa, Torreon, or immigration, so I didn't think to ask him. But piecing the story back later, basically what happened is he wanted to get his wife and his one-year-old one daughter the heck out of there. Because the problem was when Pancho Villa was on the move, you know, he would sort of take over whatever he needed, take over food, farms, people, stuff that he needed for his army. The Mexican government was trying to stop him and didn't really care who they shot in the process. So basically, you were in danger of being collateral damage if you were caught between the two. And so it was a very reasonable thing to say, let's just leave here and go somewhere else. Crossing into Texas back in those days was not a big deal. Um, so they crossed into Texas. They had relatives, they had family in Texas. For some reason, they made their way all the way to Albuquerque with no family at all, and, and kind of started uh, started up living in Albuquerque. And then eventually, my, my grandma grew up, met my grandpa, etc. So my grandmother uh, was an undocumented immigrant from Mexico. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about her later. Um, interestingly. Um, I mentioned that you know there were people that were back in 1850, 1840, 1850 that became American citizens who were of Mexican descent. Interestingly, they sort of looked down at the Mojados that were come afterward, and so uh, you had this this bifurcation in the mid 20th century, where Mexican Americans that had lived in the U.S. for 100 years or so um, sort of looked at the newcomers as kind of lower class. Thinking back to that quote I read you at the start, you know they were the wretched, the poor. You know, struggling to get through. I, I have a different way of thinking of it now, but that's certainly the, the, the outlook they had at that time. There was a lot of immigration into the United States from Mexico in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and part of that was that instability in, in Mexico. There was a lot of, of, of uh, uh, revolution going on, and people were, it was a lot of guerrilla warfare, and, and when there's guerrilla warfare going on, you're never quite sure who to trust. So your tendency is to either throw everybody in jail or shoot whoever you think looks at you a little funny. So with that instability, it's kind of understandable that other people besides my, grand, my great-grandfather and great-grandmother decided to come to the United States. In the 1930s, there was a big depression. You may have heard about that somewhere. Well, there was a worldwide depression. It was pretty depressed in Mexico economically. And so there were families that came north from Mexico in the 30s because even though as bad as it was in the U.S., it was worse down there. Um, the interesting thing about immigration and the last reason people have come is because we asked them to. In the 40s, when World War II started and a lot of American men went off to fight the battle, you probably heard that there were American women that took in, that went into the workforce, right? Worked in factories and doing things to support the war or taking the place of some of the jobs the men had vacated. You probably heard there was a huge migration of African Americans from, southern, from the southern U.S. to the northern U.S. to work in some of those factories, again, taking up some of the positions. Well, the other thing that happened is there were, there were people that left the farm fields to go fight in the war, and they were also needed to be replaced. And in the south, there were people that had migrated north that were needed to be replaced. 
So the United States government, looking for a cheap source of help, invited Mexicans to cross and kind of temporarily open the floodgates on, on, work, on temporary visas to come in and work in the fields. You've probably heard of migrant workers. This is part of the main thrust of them came from in the 40s. This was called the Bracero program. Bracero is uh, Spanish for arms. And so, uh, in a sense, we invited a wave of immigration that just kept on coming and kept on coming and kept on coming. So what happens is you go to the United States and you, know, you make a few more bucks than you did in Mexico. You send some money back, back home, and you say, hey, guess what? Nobody's trying to kill me over here. I get a few more bucks over here. Why don't you come on over? Kind of makes sense, right? So word of mouth spreads, and people want to start coming over. And it wasn't just immigration just across the border from Mexico. There were people coming from fairly deep in the interior of Mexico um, as well. So that's, a, that's pretty much how people came to be here. It's, it's a very reasonable thing, honestly. Okay. So uh, here's another question that I threw out there. Why can't they just come and assimilate and just speak English? Well, uh, thinking of the previous discussion on caps and quotas, we've never really, except for the Bracero program, which ran from the 40s to about the early, to like the late 60s, 1970s, we've never really invited um, immigrant workers to come in. I've mentioned before, even now, with our progressive you know, uh, immigration laws that were inspired by the Civil Rights Movement, only about 25,000 people from any one country can come in on a visa. So it's not easy to bring somebody in and keep them. Um, so, but um, the interesting thing is that a lot of these people, especially coming from a place like Mexico or some of the Central American country, countries of that, that origin, is things are different there than they are here. Now here, when, when you're a little kid, okay, your parents probably had a discussion like this, I hope. If we ever get lost from mom and dad, Try to find a policeman or a fireman, okay? There's somebody that can take care of you. You can trust them. That's great advice for the United States. In Mexico, that's not necessarily the best advice. Uh, the law enforcement uh, is sometimes subject to more political will than they are to moral ideals. And so uh, if it's politically expedient to not help you, then they will not help you. If it's politically expedient to hurt you, then they will hurt you. So the, the law enforcement in Mexico is something to be mistrusted and feared. And the government in Mexico for a long time is something to be mistrusted and feared. So you've got a group of people that would like to fly under the radar as much as possible. And what, you're, what you then say is, well, if you want to come to the United States, why don't you go through this lengthy, technical, cumbersome, and possibly even racist or elitist process with paperwork and signatures and copies stamps and pictures to a people that likes to fly under the radar. What's going to happen? Well, they will like to fly under the radar. Let's see if we can get in there without having to go through all that process. So that's one of the things that I think from the get-go, we're setting things up for failure by failing to understand the cultural background of the people who want to come here to work. This presupposes something, by the way. Remember, previously I just said we asked people to come. So it's one thing when people just show up at your door, right? You might feel obliged to feed them or something, or at least you know be kind to them. But when you invite them to come, once they get there, you probably better treat them well. And the United States invited people from Mexico to come, and continues to invite them to come in surreptitious ways. Um, when we built our house here in Spring Arbor, which is about a mile away from here, um, all the people that did the, uh, the interior work were all Hispanics. And they all spoke Spanish pretty heavily. They, they stayed in a group together. And, uh, and they were really good at doing the drywall and, and doing all the interior work, the floorboards, and all that sort of thing. And when they were done, they moved on to the next job. If those people weren't there, there was no construction work that was going to happen in, in our house. There was nobody else that was going to come in and do that. After we did that, um, then they came and did the landscaping for our yard. And again, there were Hispanics that were doing primarily from Mexico that did all the landscaping, planting, and they did grass seed, did uh, you know that landscaping with that thick rubber stuff that you know, kind of makes little gardens and boundaries and that, that sort of thing. Um, when those people weren't there, there was no landscaping to be done in our house. The person that owned the company said, hey, my, my guys haven't shown up from Mexico yet, so I can't come out for another month. So when we, have, when we put our our businesses in that situation where we can't do any work unless we have these folks, 
then we're asking them to come. Just sorry for that. Today, more immigrants value their culture, values, and language. They desire to work here, but they don't necessarily desire to assimilate. Now, back in previous generations of, of immigrants, this wasn't necessarily true. Some of those immigrants from Europe were escaping not just dire economic uh, uh, stuff, but dire political stuff as well. And in fact, they were looking for a better political system. The, the Mexican immigrants that came in the early part of the 20th century were probably more in that camp. But now, immigrants from Mexico and also other areas, other parts of the world, are coming here, but they're not necessarily wanting to assimilate. They're wanting to work to the economy, but mainly to generate some wealth for themselves, but to maintain their culture and maintain their language. So in other words, when we ask people to come over here and drop their language and speak English, we're sort of holding to an old, maybe even imperial idea of immigration that doesn't fit the reality of the, of the late 20th and early 21st century. So this is more the reality, and Sam Huntington has an interesting term for these people. He calls them ampersands. They think they have a duality. They think of themselves as somewhat American, but also tied to wherever they came from. Even if they were born in the U.S., they still have some of that tie to the country, to the, the country of origin. So uh, that's that's I think one of the things. The other thing I kind of wanted to uh, kind of challenge us on, and that is that a common language is the most economically efficient. There's no doubt. If you remember in the Bible, uh, the tower, the story of the Tower of Babel, uh, there were there was a lot of efficiency from speaking one language and a complete lack of efficiency from having lots of language. Well, that's a very true, in, in many ways, that's gonna be very true. If you have a country where everybody has to talk the same language, it's gonna be economically efficient to do that, okay? Like, for example, if you didn't have to translate for me, we could save a few bucks, right? Makes sense, doesn't it? But, what do we lose, okay, if we don't have other languages? What is our measure of success if it's just economics? Okay. Is there no measure of success that has to do with, with uh, wealth and culture? Uh, is, the, is there no measure of success that has to do with wealth and citizenry? Um, back in 2001, when I came to the dining commons, there were no quesadillas. So things have changed just since I've been here. And, and is that not a measure of success? I would say it is. Interestingly enough, when I was younger, there was a lot of shame in being Mexican. Even if you were somebody that was born in the United States, that has changed quite a bit across my life. Now there is more pride in being Mexican or Nicaraguan or Guatemalan or whichever country you happen to be. So, finally, is there a lesson that I can learn from this? Well, first of all, in Leviticus, God has an interesting thing that he tells the Jews. You know, he didn't say, you know, if you have any aliens and strangers among you, kick them out run them over, get rid of them. He said to love the stranger because you were once one of the land of Egypt. So treat them well. Let them live with you if they're willing to live with you. So I think that's a lesson for us as well. If we have people that are willing to live with us, in other words, they may not learn English, but they're willing to respect the laws, they're willing to contribute economically and kind of fit in in many other ways, enrich us, but also fit in in some ways, then why not let them in? Why not have them be with us? Why restrict it? Why make it difficult? Especially if we have a, a need for it. It's interesting that economists and pro-life people are the only people that value population. Uh, population, we get set, we get hit from the left. On um, we're gonna we're gonna use up all the resources on the planet. We get hit from the right. We're getting too many people that aren't like us. So the, both the left and the right are distrustful of population. But um, in many parts of the world, if you get a cow that's an increase in wealth. Well, if you get a person, maybe that's also an increase in wealth. So maybe population, we need to rethink how we look at population. In Matthew, Jesus says to desire mercy rather than sacrifice. He says it twice, and it's actually re referring to a passage of Hosea. So, you know, sometimes we have laws, we have systems that are set up, but if there are circumstances that are bigger than those systems, rather than be sticking to the system and say we have to do exactly what we said, maybe we should think of a merciful way to treat those people because that is exactly what Jesus told us to do. Here's a lesson we can learn from immigrants, even the undocumented, and that is that, that they desire a better home. And in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, it talks about the hall of faith and the people in the Old Testament that looked forward to a better thing than what they were seeing around them. 
They knew that even the animal sacrifices and the circumstances were not the ideal. Something better was coming, and they had their eyes set on that. They wanted to be a part of that, not of this. It's basically for a lot of the citizens who have crossed our southern border have that same mentality. And so they teach us a lesson. Rather than sticking, planting our flag, so to speak, here in the United States as American Christians, they remind us that there's something better coming along. Our citizenship is not American. Our citizenship is in heaven. And that's where we should be focused. And then finally in James, uh, and this is a passage I hate, actually, in James 5. Um, it says that rich oppressors, and I think maybe even the government would be involved in that as well, will be judged by how they treat the people that work for them. And so I think of this all the time when I have student workers in the School of Education. I don't want to come under the condemnation of James 5 by the way I treat them. It, it, if, it doesn't get, if it doesn't start at that base of level, then it's not going to work. So I think we have a lot of thought in terms of wealth. How wealthy do we have to be? What is enough? I mean, is it good enough to have an iPhone 5 or an iPhone 4 okay? Is the 5C going to have to do it? Is the 6 going to be it? I mean, how wealthy do we have to be? One of the things that we worry about is that immigrants are going to steal jobs, keep wages low, etc. But realistically, we are a wealthy people. We have a lot. We don't always realize that because we're always trying to get more. But we stop and think about where we're at. Maybe there is some room to share some of that wealth with people that are truly trying to leave a desperate situation. Okay, your turn. Thank you, Chuck. Any questions? Ruben, can you um, just talk about what it would cost us economically if we did not have uh, these undocumented migrant workers? For example, um, a few years ago, I was working at a camp up north of Muskegon and um, got to know a family up there who grew asparagus. And they had 100 acres. Um, so, I don't know, what be, probably close to the size of our campus, something like that. Or I don't know, maybe we're 50 acres here. But um, the asparagus rotted in the field because they couldn't get American high school university students to work for, uh, I think it was $11 an hour picking asparagus. People didn't want to do the grunt work. Um, and because of immigration laws, they couldn't get um, migrant workers to come and pick, all of that asparagus brought it in the fields. I think that's exactly what happened, Jan. Stuff just wouldn't happen. It, it's not that we could find other people to do things. They just wouldn't happen. A great movie to watch, it's, it's R-rated and it's ridiculous, okay? But it's, 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 it, it'll make you think a little. It's called The Day Without a Mexican, made back in the 90s. And it's sort of uh, what happens if the Mexican in the United States, the undocumented all got raptured, sort of, for a little while. What would happen to, the, to society? And what happened, Jan, is exactly what you said. Stuff just didn't get done. And I think that's what would happen. We would be waiting for drywall and, 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 and uh, landscaping and other things that just wouldn't get done. Um, even in places, uh, like I was just reading this in Texas, there was a, a group of teachers that were recruited from other countries to come and work, and they said they were going to take care of them, their, their visas, and allow them to live here. And then they, the school district botched the process, and now they're deporting the teachers. The other thing that's interesting is a study in Europe looked at European countries that have very easy immigration laws. It's easy to become a citizen, including Canada. Well, I'm including Canada, so I know that's kind of a um, and it found that the countries that made it easier had a greater economic impact from the immigrants. They were able to contribute. And if they, made, if they had harder laws, like especially in Norway and the Netherlands, and a lot of that is we got to preserve who we are, then the immigrants made hardly any difference. So in the United States, we've kind of had a duality. We've had it undocumented have come in in waves, and so we've seen that economic growth. And yet, on paper, we were, we're more like the Netherlands and Norway. We want to really restrict. So I think what would happen, Jen, we just wouldn't see stuff get done. You know, oh, that's, you wanted that? Oh, that's going to be two months. Sorry about that. Another anecdote. My cousin lives on East Prospect, in the middle of a Mexican community. He's uh, 
well loved by these people. I was back. He's seen over the last six years a tremendous increase in the number of his friends who picked up and shipped back. Other of his friends who can't come back again as they used to come back regularly. Now, is this a result that home security is simply off the range and not under the control of the, of the Obama administration? Or is the Obama administration directly insisting on the tremendously increased uh, exportation of, uh, of these uh, people who live here in our neighborhood? That's a good question, Dave. There, there's kind of this um, bifurcation of the sorts of the Obama administration's policy. And you get charges and countercharges. On the one hand, there's no doubt they have deported more people than any other administration today. That's a fact. But then you have people saying, well, you're deporting them, but you're deporting them in a soft way to allow them to come back easily. There's other charges that, well, you're deporting some people, but not others. For example, um, if you, you might have heard of the DREAM Act to allow federal financial aid for the, the children of undocumented citizens. Well, the Obama administration is trying not to, re, not to deport um, those children uh, to allow them to stay in the U.S. And, and go to college and do what they can to get financial aid. They can get state financial aid in lots of areas. So there's sort of a selective policy, and, and then that's yet a third accusation. You're deporting the same group of people, and sometimes literally the same people over and over again, to build the numbers to make it look like you're really doing a lot. But in, in essence, you're not doing much. So it's, it's interesting how it's gotten very even more political, if that was even possible, than the last administration on who gets deported and who doesn't. anything else you broke the law. Are we going to be in favor of law? The whole notion about law versus real people has a whole host of other kinds of uh, large conversations. But I just wonder if you reflect on where, you know, where does that, I'm sorry, we can't validate anybody who ever broke the rules or anything, so you have to go back and start. That's a good question, John. You know, going back to a couple of things I said, one is that uh, Christ said he desires mercy rather than sacrifice. And to me, if the immigration laws are a reflection of preserving who we are, and those assumptions are going out the window, may have been out the window and gone way downstream a long time ago, then maybe we need to rethink our immigration laws. Kind of like I said before with Jan, from an economic standpoint, if we, if we don't let these people and more of them in, then stuff isn't going to happen. Stuff will just not get done. But also, if there's, a, if, if there's an interest in coming to the United States, then why, why just based on national origin will we stop that? So I would say let's change our immigration laws. Uh, yes, let's be a nation of laws, but this is, this is, a, this is a goofy set of laws. Let's, let's totally redo them from the ground up. Um, go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say we have time for one more question. After the question, I've got some suggestions for what to do, how we can in, in, increase our knowledge after. But yeah, um, with the like drug wars going on and the border and the drug cartels, and there's been some tight tension between Mexico and America. You say it's a big part right now, and uh, stuff getting done is going to hurt you more. Okay, so you're saying where do the drug wars fit in? By the way, I'll mention the LA Times does a great job of keeping up with that. So if you want to know more about that, the LA Times, I think, is the, is the best job of anybody. They have a whole section and an investigative team looking at that. But um, interestingly enough, you know, one of the things people have been asking, I'm trying to make this 2014, what is the legalization movement in the U.S. going to do with, with, with drugs in Mexico? Right now, what happens is uh, the, the, the Border Patrol sometimes gets involved in drug interdiction, but that's really the, the purview of uh, alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, which is under the Department of Justice along with the FBI. So there's different agent, government agencies that both take different ways of dealing with the situation. But 
one of the things that, that people are starting to, to, to see now is as the legalization movement happens in the U.S., um, there's sort of a, a desire to, to kind of keep your turf. And so it's, it's actually made some of the drug wars a little more difficult. There was a major drug war that was, that was arrested in Mexico very recently. Um, and, and part of the reason that, that that was kind of a significant thing is that there was, there was, it was a cartel that they've been kind of getting out the number two, number three, number four people. They finally got the top guy. But in terms of the cartel itself, the, they're fighting over the, the turf of who can control the drug flow in the United States. If there's a significant drug um, source in the United States, people growing their own marijuana, then what the fear is is that we're going to see more of the drug wars spill into the United States, like the old mafia wars during Prohibition, where you know you're you're growing too much weed over here in Oregon, you're interfering with my with my ability to, to smuggle weed in from Iwana, so we're going to go all the way to Oregon and knock you off. That's it's something interesting to see if that actually develops. Obviously, the people that are in favor of legalization are not wanting to see that happen. But at least in the initial, like in the last year, the, the drug activity has gotten worse, not better, with the legalization movement in the United States. And people thought, if we legalize in the U.S., we'll ease that. That hasn't happened yet. Okay, so here's some things. If you want to take away, how can I learn more about the subject? Here's some ideas. Uh, shameless plug for Core 200. Uh, Core 200 is a great course. I'm, I'll be teaching next spring. And the other people that teach Core 200 are awesome. You won't go wrong picking anybody to, to, to be in Core 200. But all the Core 200 courses will talk about immigration. Take a road trip to the border or to the barrio. The border is a long ways from here. It's quite a road trip. The barrio is not so far. But get out of the normal places you go to. Go to a place where there are a lot of Hispanics there. Just kind of look around and see. Next time you're at Myers or someplace, look at how many things are in Spanish or Lowe's or Home Depot or places like that. Um, and, and kind of become aware of where, where Hispanics are, where they live. In Jackson, for example, where do Hispanic people tend to live? There's like three clusters in, in Jackson. So, so kind of just get your radar up. And if you want to get ambitious, take a road trip to the border. It'd be great. I always tell people you need to do road trips at this age. Um, Another thing is seek balance in, in understanding the issues. Um, these are some of the places I look at Fox News Latino, Huffington Post, Latino Voices. The Pew Hispanic Center does a lot of nice uh, survey research. The LA Times, like I mentioned, is wonderful, especially on drug coverage. And even local sources like Opinion, which is a Spanish language newspaper in Lansing, um, they do a really good job. So I'd say, you know, seek balance. Don't go to just one place to find out what's going on, but seek balance in, in the coverage of immigration. Um, some of, the, some of the authors that I think speak to immigration really well, Luis Urea, Ruben Martinez, and Ilian Stavans, are, are three of them. There are many, but these are the, some of the books I've read that I thought, yeah, these guys know what they're talking about. So reading a book by one of them, I think, would be a good idea. Um, Cesar Chavez comes out today. Okay, so if you want to, if you, you know, you, you can get away from March Madness for the weekend or sometime next week, go watch Cesar Chavez and find out. The farm workers that he defended were from the Bracero movement of the 1940s. They were invited to come here. They were asked to come here. And then the question is, what happened to them once they heard? Well, Cesar Chavez was trying to help them out. So go see the movie. I haven't seen it yet, but it's on my list. I told Ben to a day without a Mexican. Any movie by Robert Rodriguez, uh, Spy Kids, the Machete trilogy. Um, the interesting thing about Rodriguez, he casts a lot of Hispanic actors and actresses and also employs them as, as film crew and you know all the behind the scenes stuff. So if you ever look at the credits for a Robert Rodriguez movie, you'll see a lot of, uh, of a lot of Latino surnames in there because that's kind of his thing to do that. Um, a couple of other interesting movies, um, if you're a, kind of the movie type. Um, one of them is For Greater Glory. That was the story of uh, the, the, kind of the Mexican government's instability and push against Catholicism in the 1920s. Uh, and the other one, especially if you, if you think that the political left has the moral high ground a lot of times, uh, and starring Pancho Villa as himself, Will, will make you realize the political left doesn't necessarily have the moral high ground. Uh, neither does the political right. I think we're still looking for that moral high ground. Nobody's really grabbed it yet. But in starring Pancho Villa as himself, very interesting story of how to manufacture a hero. Um, so uh, those are all things I would recommend that you do to sort of uh, learn more about the subject. So with all that, God bless you, and I hope you have a great weekend.